Welcome to the presentation on financial analysis techniques. So this reading essentially is about a lot of ratios and for me the job is easy. I am just going to describe these ratios to you and give you some hints in terms of how to remember these ratios and then your job is to learn these ratios and practice as many questions as possible. In addition to ratios, we will also talk about the concept of return on equity and the DuPont relationship, which again is based on some of the ratios that you will study here. So the first thing is to understand various categories of ratios. You will see activity ratios. These measure how effectively a company performs day-to-day -day tasks such as the collection of receivables, management of inventory, etc. So on this slide, you are just getting an overview of the categories. In subsequent slides, we will talk about these ratios in more detail. Liquidity ratios measure a company's ability to meet its short-term obligations. Solvency ratios measure a company's ability to meet long-term debt obligations. Some of these ratios are known as leverage ratios as well as long-term debt ratios. Profitability ratios measure the company's ability to generate profitable sales from its resources. And valuation ratios measure the quantity of an asset of flow associated with ownership of a specified claim. We will do these valuation ratios in a lot of detail when we study equity. Okay, so let's talk about equity ratios first. Perhaps one of the most important equity ratios or activity ratios is the inventory turnover ratio. So inventory turnover ratio refers to cost of goods sold in the numerator divided by average inventory. So this is basically COGS divided by average inventory. Now most of these ratios that you will see here are mixed ratios. What I mean by that is we have a numerator that comes from the income statement and a denominator which comes from the balance sheet. And you will always see that in these turnover ratios, the income statement item is in the balance sheet. So cost of goods sold, revenue, purchases, revenue, 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 all income statement numbers. And the denominator you will see these, these uh, numbers or variables are all coming from the balance sheet. Another important point is that the balance sheet numbers generally we look at the average so average inventory what we need to do here is remember inventory is taken on a given day so if we are looking at the inventory turnover ratio for 2010 we will look at the cost of goods sold for 2010 and divide that by the average inventory in 2010 if you are looking at an annual report with numbers for 31st december 2010 and 31st December 2009, then you simply take the average of those two numbers. Days of inventory, actually one more quick point in terms of what this ratio is telling you. So a high ratio is telling you that the company is selling a lot of inventory and maintaining low average inventory. So if the numerator is high and the denominator is low, that's a good thing. And that is showing a lot of activity. That means that inventory is moving through the company very fast, which is good, all else equal. Days of inventory in hand is equal to the number of days in a period. And if the period is a year, then this is 365 divided by the inventory turnover, which we just calculated up here. So 365 divided by inventory turnover. This gives an idea of approximately how long inventory sits at this company. So a high number is bad. That means inventory sits around for a long time. A low number is good because that means that inventory moves fast and hence doesn't sit at the company for very long. Now you need to just memorize all these other ratios. Remember that receivables turnover is revenue divided by average receivables. A high number is good because that would imply high revenue 
and low average receivables days of sales outstanding tells us approximately how long it takes us to collect our receivables payable turnover is the total money spent on purchases divided by average trade payables from a cash flow perspective a uh, high number basically says that we are making a lot of purchases and we keep payables low that means we pay our suppliers very fast and so on uh, working capital turnover is revenue divided by average working capital working capital remember is uh, current assets so current assets minus current liabilities fixed asset turnover is revenue divided by average net fixed assets and total asset turnover is revenue divided by average total assets so learn all these next comes liquidity ratios so commonly used liquidity ratios are given right here the most important one is current ratio which is current assets divided by current liabilities quick ratio is a little more conservative it does not consider inventory and cash ratio is the most conservative as it simply takes cash and short term marketable securities divided by current liabilities defensive interval ratio gives a sense for the number of days you can survive with the cash that you have or let's just say that we are taking cash short term marketable securities and receivables so we are taking our most liquid current assets and let's say that this combination of these equal 200000 and let's say our daily cash expenditure is 40000 this would say that our defensive interval ratio is 200000 divided by 40000 which is 5 days so we in this situation have 5 days worth of liquid assets another liquidity measure that you've seen before and you will see again in corporate finance is the cash conversion cycle also called the net operating cycle this is equal to days of inventory on hand which we calculated on the earlier slide days of sales outstanding also from the earlier slide minus the number of days of payables commonly used solvency ratios so there are a few categories here debt ratios first of all refers to debt so debt to assets ratio is total debt divided by total assets debt to capital ratio total debt divided by total debt plus total equity uh debt to equity ratios total debt divided by total equity financial leverage ratio is average total assets divided by total equity so you might wonder here where uh, debt comes into play and debt is covered implicitly because equity is simply assets minus liabilities and leverage ratio means leverage means how much debt a company has taken a high leverage ratio means high debt so to give you a very simple example let's say you have company a with assets equal to 10 debt equal to 2 and equity equal to 8 what is the leverage ratio over here the leverage ratio is total assets 10 divided by equity 8 so this is equal to 1. to 5 versus company b has again assets equal to 10 and let's say debt equal to 8 and equity equal to 2 so for this company the financial leverage ratio would be 10 divided by 2 which is 5 so this company since it has a lot more debt is heavily leveraged so high debt means low equity which is in the denominator and this means very high leverage for company b coverage ratios give a sense for our operating earnings divided by interest payment so when you are evaluating how good a company will be at repaying a loan you want to see a high interest coverage ratio so ideally you want high operating income divided by low interest payments if this ratio is high that's great if this ratio is low that is saying that ebit is low and interest payments are high so there is a big risk here because 
if uh, EBIT falls, then the interest payments might exceed EBIT, which would not be a good sign. Fixed charge coverage refers to EBIT plus lease payments divided by interest payments plus lease payments. The idea here is that we are also including lease payments. Remember EBIT is earnings before interest and tax and we are treating lease payments like an obligation. So lease payments in a sense are payments that have to be made just the way interest payments have to be made. So what we do in the numerator is look at our earnings without having to pay the lease payments. Remember to come up with our operating income we've already subtracted lease payments. So we add back lease payments to see how much income we have without interest taxes and lease payments. That's the numerator. And in the denominator, we are looking at the total payments that we need to make, which are the interest payments and the lease payments. So this is just a more rigorous or more comprehensive form of the interest coverage ratio. You will understand this better when we study leases later on in financial reporting and analysis. Profitability ratios. We have gross profit margin, which is gross profit divided by revenue, operating profit margin, which is operating profit divided by revenue, pre-tax margin, which is EBT divided by revenue, and the most commonly used ratio, which is net income divided by revenue. These are all income statement ratios. Then you have some mixed ratios like return on assets, operating ROA. This tells us our operating income divided by average total assets, return on assets, which is net income divided by average total assets. This is very important because it's telling us how much income we are generating per uh, for, for our assets. Return on total capital is typically operating income divided by short term and long term debt plus equity. Return on equity is uh, net income divided by total equity. This is also very important because this is telling us that for the investment that we've made in the company or the investment that, in, that shareholders have made, how much net income are they generating from that. Return on common equity is the net income minus preferred dividend divided by our equity. And now let's talk about DuPont analysis. The whole point of DuPont analysis is that it lets you decompose return on equity. So you might have company A and company B both with a 15% return on equity. Now, it might seem on the surface that both companies are doing equally well, so they are both generating a 15% return. But the DuPont analysis allows us to get underneath the covers and figure out where this 15% is coming from. So remember, return on equity is equal to net income divided by equity. So the first level of decomposition is saying that net income over equity can be decomposed into return on assets multiplied by financial leverage. So what is return on assets? That is net income divided by our total assets. And if you recall from before, the financial leverage we said was equal to total assets divided by equity. So notice the total assets would cancel out or can cancel out and we are left with net income over equity. So you will see potentially some questions on the exam where you are given two companies. Both companies have the same ROE but one company has a much higher leverage. So what, what would that mean? So that would mean that the company with the higher leverage obviously then will have a, rit a lower return on assets. So this is the first level decomposition. The second level decomposition, which is probably the most important, breaks return on equity into three components. Financial leverage stays, but return on asset now is broken into net profit margin, total asset turnover, and let's just multiply this out and see. So net profit margin, as you've just seen, is net income divided by revenue. And then total asset 
turnover is equal to revenue divided by total assets so remember all these turnover ratios will have a income statement number in the numerator and a balance sheet number in the denominator and then from up here we just carry forward the financial leverage number which is total assets divided by equity so notice that here again these uh, the revenue and revenue cancel out total assets total assets cancel out so we are left with net income over equity so the point here is that the return on equity for a company according to this relationship comes from three sources the profit margin the how efficiently the total assets are used to to provide revenue so this is the efficiency with which you are using your assets and then leverage so a company might have a high return on equity simply because of a high leverage ratio where the company has taken on high debt which means low equity so if roe is high because of this then the analyst should be able to detect that and this is clearly a very risky strategy now the third and final level is right here where we can break the further decompose net income into three different elements so this can be broken down the net income over revenue can be broken into net income over ebt multiply ebt stands for earnings before tax multiplied by ebt so earnings before tax divided by earnings before interest and tax so that's the operating income multiplied by the operating margin or ebit margin which is ebit divided by revenue so notice that these cancel out and these cancel out and we are left with net income over revenue now net income divided by ebt gives us this tax burden so if the tax is low we'll have a nice ratio over here of net income divided by earnings before tax this tells us how much interest we have so if this ratio is high so if our interest is low then this ratio is going to be good and ebit over revenue is our ebit margin or operating margin and if our operating expenses are low then this ratio is good so it would be good if you learn all three formulas and they are not very hard to learn because once you get the general idea it's there is a lot of cancellation which essentially leads you back to return on equity the questions on this can be a little tricky so i'd encourage you as always to practice questions from the curriculum as well as your study notes and finally valuation ratios so at this stage just memorize what you see here price earnings ratio is the price per share divided by earnings per share price per cash flow is the price per share divided by cash flow per share price per sales is price per share divided by sales per share and price per book value is price per share divided by book value per share and as i mentioned earlier when we do the section on equity you will see all these in detail so again i have gone through this fast but that does not mean this reading is not important in fact it's extremely important you will have noticed that every reading so far or at least every reading in this uh, study session 8 has a segment on ratios at the end and in this reading a lot of those ratios and financial analysis have been consolidated and the curriculum has lots of very good questions so make sure you do this well